I love this panel, you guys. Everyone oh. dinged in at exactly, exactly 10000 when we did our prep call. I'm still getting over the, we found two fellows and we gave them a $100,000 phrase. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little, <laughs> I, I didn't hear a single word past that. I was, I was so impressed. All right, on this panel, you guys, um, we have, um, to my immediate left, we have Ben, who just this past cycle was the chief digital officer at the Republican Governors Association. Um, prior to that, he has served roles, including at the Creative Artists Agency, at Google, at Unilever, um, as well as Romney for president at the National, uh, I'm sorry, the Republican National Convention, the National Republican Senatorial Committee, and um, of course, as I just mentioned, um, at the RGA. Um, he has directed over $100 million in targeted digital advertising. In the middle, we have Pamela, who is the Senate Majority PAC's first ever digital director. Um, prior to that, she worked as a, at a top New York State digital, um, a top New York State political firm, where she was named one of New York City's 40 under 40 rising stars by city and state in 2016. And at the end of the panel here, um, last but not least, we have Phil, who is a senior vice president at Push Digital. Um, he leads digital strategy, or has led digital strategy for Marco Rubio's 2016 re-election campaign. Um, he has directed fund, online fundraising for South Carolina's Congressman Trey Gowdy. Um, he, prior to joining Push Digital in 2016, served as vice president of digital at Stone Group, um, Stone Group, Stone Ridge Group, and founded Brushfire Digital, a digital consultancy for Republican candidates and committees. Um, so I want to start off. Um, gosh, there's so much to cover cover in our on our data panel here, but um, one of my favorite subjects, as you guys know. Um, so, in in our session description, I'll start there, um, and then we can veer wherever you guys want to go here. Um, in our session description, it says, "How have campaigns involved their harvesting of voter data to ensure a richer and more relevant set of data points?" Um, so, I take that to interpret. And I interpret that to mean kind of how did it go? What were the main lessons um, that we took from the last cycle in terms of using that voter data and or making it richer and more relevant? So um, who would like to start with talking about that voter, that wonderful voter data? Go for it. <laughs> I'll start just position-wise. Um, well, on the, on the Republican side of the aisle uh, for almost any Republican campaign or committee organization, there's a heavy reliance on the two major players in our space, uh, which are I360 and Data Trust. And I think over the years, there's a point where there's, there's always uh, a narrative in the media, who's ahead or behind on data, who's ahead or behind on digital. And uh, I think right now, uh, the Republican Party and entities operating within Republican campaign space feel pretty good about where we are because I think the competition between I360 and Data Trust have really turned them both into significantly better uh, operations year over year and cycle over cycle. And uh, the reelect is definitely encouraging all the Republican campaigns and committees that they speak to to double down on using Data Trust to ensure that um, as much information is coming into that overall pool uh, from elections, uh, local and uh, from small, statewide. Uh, across the country. So uh, those firms, as they continue to bring in more people, get better and more experienced folks. Um, right now, I think as a political organization, we feel really good about the quality of data they're able to bring in both off the voter file, as well as uh, layering in consumer data and working with teams internally to constantly find new ways to bring in new information about um, potential voters to really create like a really deep, rich understanding of um, who we're trying to reach. Um, so I will say um, this cycle, I think we, um, we actually, you know, there was never a single campaign or race that we worked on that we didn't use. Um, you know, we used more than one data set every single time. Our approach was never uh, singular. It always involved sort of varying data sets and varying um, sort of universes. And so really when we, you know, when we were thinking about what we were going to use and how we were going to use it from the voter file to zip codes, 
um, to in-platform data. Um, it was really about thinking about the universe that we were talking to and what made the most sense, and also about layering. Um, so, you know, when we know that there are traps with certain data sets, um, we were able to sort of fill those or expand on them using, you know, other sort of targeting methods. Um, so our approach was very holistic in that sense, and I, I feel pretty proud about the work that we did um, in that regard. Um, I'd have to say, for me, the biggest thing that happened this cycle was the reliability of data that was obtained from modeling became incredibly reliable. Uh, I think my best example of this cycle was suburban women, GOP women, who were pro-Second Amendment but also pro-assault weapons ban. From a messaging standpoint, that is a minefield, and if you get it wrong, you're in a, a world of pain. And um, having just reliable models this cycle that were really effective and that were able to help us drill down on those targets uh, was just, for me, really cool. Uh, seeing those go from you know, a target universe into a turnout universe and seeing your message work and feeling good about these expensive models, uh, I think, for me, this cycle, that's, that's what happened. So that took us like 90 seconds to get from the voter file to the modeling data. Um, how fast in each of your campaigns did you kind of, you know, let's, let's talk about that because we, we hear that question a lot where especially in political clients cam come or campaigns come and they think the voter file is like the end all be all. But then very quickly as digital strategists we say, you know what, it's not the voter file that is the key here, it's this consumer file, the native file, the, the modeling data. How quickly in your, your um, campaigns do you feel like you turn um, sometimes towards that in almost entirely? Well, you know, I think, and Ben could probably elaborate on this too, on the Republican side, um, with the organizations that we work with, the voter file is kind of like the foundational piece of that data set. So no matter what, you're touching the, data, the voter file. But it's all the different layers, whether it's modeling or uh, you know, just the data points that have flowed in, have kind of made the data, there are greater indicators in the data than just somebody's voter ID or their voter history nowadays, in some cases. Some cases, those are still the things you're looking for. But the availability of data laid on top of that voter file has kind of changed the game in the last several cycles. Yeah, I would just you know, say that I think building out those models, which is looking at the voter file as a base layer and then understanding how we think people are actually going to behave, it was a starting point for our organization and I think most of the major organizations at the very beginning of the cycle and trying to look at the most recent lessons. So for example, with the Republican Governor Association trying to look at the elections in 2017, we had two governor's races in 2017 that we um, were paying a lot of attention to and working with. And then looking at the results, seeing how maybe the end, uh, uh, the turnout actually differed from a lot of the polling and maybe differed from our uh, internal models, if it did. And then going into the beginning of 2018 with polling focus groups, looking at the results there and working very, very closely with external data partners and data scientists to be able to understand what were we accurate about looking at 2017, what were we wrong about in 2017, and knowing that there's a really major election, or there's going to be 36 governor's elections in 2018, how do we make sure that we are being properly informed to get things right where we got them right and get them right where we got them wrong just a year ago? So, and that's really, really the starting point when we look to figure out how we're going to allocate funds for, uh, for the rest of the year. So. Um as we know, the voter file and the modeling data and the programmatic data does talk to each other relatively well. Um, and then there are what we call, or I guess in the session description, walled gardens. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that. It, does that exist? Or where, where do you find that there are so-called walled gardens? Or where does the data not talk over well? Or where do you find frustrations where you don't feel like the data um, works, and, and that could be across a certain platform or, um, you know, across a party, like, wh where, where is the data not going where you want it to go? So to, to, to speak very briefly about the voter file um, and, and the modeling, um, I would say, you know, we, we certainly use that as a baseline um, and then, you know, sort of built our way up from that. And I think part of that, you know, part of the conversation that we were having this cycle that speaks to... Uh, sort of the walled garden issue, which I think is increasingly going to become um, 
uh, problematic uh, as we're seeing more regulations and more players come in. You know, we're looking like, I think NBC, uh, you just announced today that they're gonna run a new streaming service. And so, you know, the data becomes increasingly protected. And so the conversation that I think, you know, we're starting to have and need to continue to have is, how do we work across these walled gardens? How do we track people across these walled gardens? And then also, how do we weight these different data sets? So like, how are we weighting, um, you know, the voter file, to the modeling, to zip codes, um, and to other forms to make a good decision about who we're talking to and how we're talking to them. Yeah, I mean, just in terms of specific um, media placements, there are wall gardens, for example, uh, with Google reservation buys, which we found were pretty efficient. They're force view, sound on. You um, see it's force view. Um, you, know, you can't bring your own data. By that, you can't just send them a list of voters. Right? In most of the cases when we're saying data, we mean like a list of voters. So we can't send them a list of voters and say, we want to hit these people. You can use that for other uh, tools uh, within their portfolio, but not for that. Or with Hulu, for example, you can't send them a list of voters, but it's force view, audio on, in some cases, full television size um, inventory, so it's very high quality. So, I mean, in those cases, you have a list of voters. Just because you can't upload that list of voters doesn't mean you can't break that list of voters down by where they fit in within certain zip codes. Are, do they more heavily skew male versus female? Um, some of these platforms maybe you can target with by household income, or you can target um, by age. So there's a number of different ways where you just, by understanding what that actually voter list looks like, you can find the most effective, um, the most effective kind of counterpart within the types of targeting that that system does allow. Um, and so all systems are going to allow you to do geo-targeting down to a zip code. They're all going to allow you to do different variations of age targeting, of gender targeting. So in cases where we really want to have a similar uh, approach across a number of different walled gardens where we couldn't bring our own voter list, we would try to find those similar kind of universal targeting uh, options that we felt most closely corresponded with that actually voter list that we cared about. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I'm not a magician, so I can only do what I can do. The, I'm not there to serve the data. The data is there to serve me. And in different spaces, you're going to use different things. And sometimes you're just going to use, you know, what's available within that platform. And so I, I'm pretty data agnostic, and I try not to be dogmatic about, okay, this is the data set, and we're never going to stray from this data set. There's so many factors that go into deciding how I'm going to target and what I'm, you know, when I'm going to target and what list I'm going to use or if I'm going to use a list at all. And I think it really is touch and go based on a series of factors, including budget, including time uh, and geography. What's great about this space is there's so many different ways to slice the pie, and I don't feel constrained to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a single data set at any given moment. So how do you answer a client or a question then of what's the frequency? Like how, if, if there's so many walled gardens and you're buying across so, so many different platforms, how do you know how many times your audience is, you know, how do you know it's too much with, a, with certain eyeballs or not enough? I mean, I give separate frequencies for different platforms. So like there is not a blended frequency. I mean, yeah, I mean, um, I think it's something that we're going to have to continue to address. Um, I think it's something that, you know, is not an, only an issue um, in our field, but also on the corporate side, right? Um, and it's something that we're going to have to work on. I imagine, or I'm kind of curious to see the role of first-party data and how that plays into it. Like, when we think about... Um, you know, how we're tracking with pixels and things like that, um, if that's going to increasingly become um, more and more important in the work that we do. So when we were on our call, we talked a little bit about native data. So that's the data that, um, you know, is inside of just Facebook or, or inside of just Google. Um, talk to us a little bit about that and your preferences or your, you know, any successes or um, failures with, you know, just relying on the in-platform data and what, what have you liked or didn't like um, that you saw this cycle? Go ahead. I mean, I'm generally pretty, pretty positive on in-platform data because uh, when people talk about companies like Google or Facebook, generally they're talking about how well they know the users, how much information they have on them. So. Um, 
obviously you kind of a trust but, but verify. We like to think that if these companies are the ones who directly are owning and anonymizing this information, they have the most access to it. So there's a good chance that a company like Google or Facebook might know a lot more about who on their platform fits profile X and working through their targeting tools, they make their money through advertising. So the more effective their advertising is, the more money they make as a company, the more people want to work with them. So they have every incentive to make sure that their native targeting tools are the best possible ones to utilize within their platform. Um, also, as a lot of these um, companies are less interested in having uh, third-party data imported into them for privacy purposes and privacy concerns, so they'd rather you use their in-house targeting. Um, and for example, bringing your outside data in for almost any platform, you're probably using LiveRamp is kind of the almost universal tool. It's gone a lot better over the years, but you know your match rate often can be as low or lower than 30 percent. So I think people forget that across this funnel of taking your own information and eventually getting in front of a voter, there's significant drop off. Or it could take two step. days. What? You know, your, your onboarding of data could take a while. Yeah, it could take a while. It could take a week. I mean, with some of these platforms, hey, it'll take a week, and then 30% of these people will have a cookie for. And then you're just going to trust that when they actually find a cookie, that that desktop cookie actually really is the desktop cookie of your person. Yeah. I mean, if you actually break down the step, you have to have a lot of trust and a lot of imagination to believe that all this works, and then all of a sudden there'll be an article in the Wall Street Journal about 75% of impressions are all fraud anyway. So... Um, you will say, okay, it's, it's nice, and I think a lot of people who aren't in the digital space on the campaign team always like, use our own data. Like, we have the information. But if they actually thought about how much they break it down, you know, how many of, how effective is that really? It's something we still utilize and use heavily, but um, if Google says they know how to find people who care about X, um, I tend to find that they, they are pretty, that's pretty reliable. Yeah, I mean, uh I absolutely agree. Um, I think, you know, we just think about, I mean, when you think about Facebook and Google and you think about the absolute share that they have um, in terms of data, marketplace, you know, ad spend, um, it, they just have a lot more data points um, and they are in the business of data. Um, so why would we not use or, you know, uh, continue to engage in sort of that in-platform data and build off of it? Um, you know, one of the things I will say uh, that we, you know, we engaged in a lot of the cycle was lookalike models. Um, and so that was very much a practice of thinking about um, what data sets do we have and how do we bring it into these platforms and how can they use what, um, you know, what points that they have to make a larger universe that might be receptive to the uh, messaging that we are looking to. Um, and, you know, again, um, I think it's, again, like a, a trust but verify uh, sort of situation um, in all cases. Um, uh, and I would include Facebook and Google in that. I mean, I agree with that all generally. I, I myself am a expensive data addict. I love it. I think it's awesome and it, I can see in a lot of instances it gives me a strategic advantage uh, when working with a campaign. That being said, you know, I work with a lot of campaigns that are small dollar uh, campaigns. You know, they're congressional campaigns or congressional challengers, and the best data they can get a hold of is uh, the first party data, and it's good. It doesn't, it, they're not, uh, you know, losing anything by using that data, and I have a lot of confidence in it. Um, again, it's about not being dogmatic with, you know, your platforms or with the data you use and just kind of uh, using some common sense and strategic sense to get the best, uh, the best product for your client. I'll just add real quickly is a lot of campaigns out there are very small and very yeah. lean. In fact, majority of campaigns are probably surprisingly small and lean, with the exception of a few real marquee, you know, governor's races and Senate races and very few marquee congressional races. Obviously, presidentials are very well staffed. It's a lot of pressure to put on every campaign out there to say, you have to have data and just throw the word data around a lot. They don't even know what you're talking about, which who would? I mean, it's a very broad general word. And then they need to find someone to come in and, and sell them. There's something that they don't understand. And for an organization that's very lean, that doesn't necessarily have a ton of experience in this space, and doesn't have a lot of extra money to spend, if there is information, if there is targeting segments within these major platforms, including some of the major DSPs, you know, the programmatic uh, buying tools like those owned by Verizon or those by, owned by Adobe, these are companies that are investing a lot of money into making sure they have good data sets in-house. It just makes things a lot easier and a lot more efficient for a smaller campaign. When you're working at an agency or within a bigger group, you obviously are going to put, kind of hold yourself to 
it's like a higher standard where you really want to have all the chips on the table, but for a smaller campaign, it's almost not fair to pressure them into thinking they need to have a huge first party data set, especially one that's a first time. Totally candidate. agree. My, my only problem with first party data is sort of the sensibilities of the companies that are providing it. So not every data point they'll make is made available to you. So you've got to make some guesses. And when I'm working with a model or I'm working with one of the, the, the big uh, you know, data firms, I'm pretty much talking to exactly, I, at least I know I'm talking to exactly who I'm trying to reach. Um, so you're kind of at the whim of Facebook if they want to give you, you know, a race or gender data point. That's sometimes really important to who you're targeting. So let's talk a little bit about transparency on the public side of what what we're all doing. So um, you guys described a lot of a lot of behind the scenes thinking here of what you guys are doing with different data sets and how much you like having this data and what you're choosing and you're pulling a lot of levers and you know we're doing a lot of creative thinking as well as data driven thinking um, and then along kind of comes these regulations or you know now on Facebook we can kind of see what you're targeting. Um, how do you deal with that as a practitioner and how much how much of that is a good thing? How much of that is a bad thing? How is it, if at all, changed the way you buy? I, I can jump in a little bit. I know I think, especially this last year, this was the cycle where a lot of changes came in from Facebook, fr from Google. Um, you know, I was mentioned by the last speaker. Uh, there's some states entirely like Nevada and uh, I think others, uh, including New Jersey, where there's significant, and, and Maryland, where there's significant restrictions because of new laws that were passed in these states demanding certain types of transparency. The platforms just weren't prepared to provide from a tech, like they just technically could not provide it yet. Their platforms weren't built to. Um, and Facebook rolled out a lot of changes that probably frustrated a lot of different people in the ad buying space um, around verification, et cetera. So, the, the people who would be most opposed is, oh, this, the secrecy is gone. I think most people who are actually really evangelists for digital, like we don't want digital to be seen as some secret little toolkit which you pull out of your pocket and kind of do a surprise attack with. And, but you really spend your money on television, but maybe we want to do a fun little trick with digital. No one who's working digital space wants to or sees digital that way. We see it as a medium to reach the most people in the most places, the most time of day, for the, what's actually in front of their eyes. Uh, and affecting their, their perspective. So um, the, the, I think some of the people come, uh, some of the people who don't really work in digital but come from a more traditional standpoint of other platforms were really upset how, how they're gonna make our secrets public even though their television buying has been public all along. Um, I think a hope for a lot of people working in digital space is the additional transparency helps decision makers whether or not they have experience or come from a digital buying perspective realize, oh wow, we need to keep up. And that horse race mentality, which really drives all the television buying, then come to digital, then comes to digital, and we can actually keep people accountable. When organizations and individuals say they're gonna double down uh, on digital, which everyone says every single time, but very few people do, they can be called out for it. You can't say that we're gonna be innovative and using online media and not do it. Um, and, and hopefully you're incentivized by what your competition's doing. I feel like I took a lot of that time. So. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, in regards to the transparency reports and regulations, I mean, I think every every cycle uh, we always go through certain frustrations and learnings with uh, with uh, with the various platforms um, and companies. Um, this cycle was no no exception. Um, you know, uh, a lot of the things were rolled out, um, and I, you know, again have found um, it's been pretty. Some pretty exciting things have come out of it, including the transparency report um, and the ways in which we can use it. Um, uh, you know, and so pretty excited to see where that goes. But um, you know, one important thing for us was to always be very nimble in that regard to understand that, you know, uh, to to a certain extent, we are at the whim of some of these platforms. Um, and that uh, we have to be able to move and shift quickly when things change, like, you know, Washington State, again, there were a couple of other states where, you know, uh, it's like you can no longer run ads in this state because of a recent lawsuit. Um, 
You know, and then again, speaking to sort of the regulations, um, you know, with the walled gardens, there were also a number of shifts that I think Facebook and Google made this cycle um, in terms of first party data and how to address it. And so I think that that's something increasingly that we're going to have to be cognizant of as we move forward. Yeah, I don't, I agree here. I don't think it's really stopped anything that we wouldn't have done otherwise. I mean, there's some frustrations on, on what we could and couldn't do, but I think for any, if anything, it just made me more creative uh, on how I approach a race. Um, you know, I'm like the Velociraptor from Jurassic Park. Life finds a way, we'll figure it out, we'll get around it, we'll open those doors. And I think um, it caused everybody on my team just to be very cognizant that, uh, you know, everything we put out there at some level can be seen and, uh, you know, that we don't, we don't ever want to be part of the news cycle, or at least our firm. We want to be a, a positive add to our clients and not, um, not a drag on their electability. Yeah. I feel like everyone, I know a bunch of people who spoke earlier today, everyone who's, like, here on these panels or talking today, we're proud of doing the stuff we do the right way. Like, none of us are here to use digital as a, a sneaky trick. So it's exciting for people to actually see the scope of the type of creative that people are producing and the investment these organizations are putting in because we're, and you know, we don't, the transparency is great. It's like there'll be more spotlight on all of the work that's being done and how well it's being done. So um, speaking of kind of like your, your ninja abilities, um, one of the things that we talked about on the prep call is kind of keeping and, and retaining talent um, in this field and the people who have the unique skill sets to do what it takes on these teams. Um, can, can each of you talk a little bit about that? Like, what do you look for in your team members? Um, how do you keep them from cycle to cycle in a business like this? And, and um, you know, just, just talk about building a digital first team. Sure. I mean, this is a big deal for me, and it's something I've really worked hard at at Push Digital. Um, the first thing I do when I try to hire somebody, I, I, I don't look for their previous experience or skill. I'm looking for someone who just won't bullshit me. Because as long as you are telling me the truth and you know, being straight up honest about what we're doing on a daily basis, then we can find a way and we can figure out how to navigate um, an election cycle. And then the second thing I would say is um, you've got to have people who uh, you're willing to pay and you've got to, you've got to pay them well. Um, you know, so I've come from the campaign background where everybody was disposable. After election day, you know, that person got cut and everybody was looking for a job. I don't want that. I want people who are going to stick with me cycle after cycle and learn with me. And um, I think we've been really good about that. And really, it comes from just making sure uh, they view this as a career, not just a single stopping point along the way. I mean, it's... Um Talent is tough. <laughs> yeah. um, and certainly, you know, I think our approach um, and increasingly the approach, um, you know, again, is, um, you know, some of the work that Priorities is doing, for example, is, you know, getting these fellowships, getting more folks in the door, building more infrastructure, um, and creating space. Um, you know, again, it's not just talent. We're also talking about space for digital, which, um, you know, it's still a conversation that we're having. Um, and so, you know, as those conversations continue to grow, I think the talent will as well. Um, I would add just, you know, in, in terms of the approach to data, approach to creative, you know, it's the same thing, you know, it's not always someone with the, you know, the, the uh, most prolific background or someone with the most experience, you know, Things change in digital so fast that you want to work with people who are able to understand that, who are able to be nimble and able to question their own assumptions. Um, and so, yeah. yeah. I 100% agree. I feel like recruiting is probably the, if not one of the most important roles for someone who's running a digital operation in the political space. Uh, one of the advantages of working in the political space is that the people you are working with, you can bring on the team, are actually really passionate in the success of the project, the initiative you're working on. They, you know, ideologically, uh, in terms of, you know, intellectually, what's something they really care about personally, they are deciding to work in politics because hopefully, and for the most part, they really care about what type of people get elected to office and what types of policies those people are able to support. So I think uniquely within a political, uh, a political team, you have people that really care day in, day out, um, 
in a way that's really hard to find in a non-political space about all working on the same mission. Um, you know, that said, I think there's a lot more, the, the digital team's working an area with a lot more complexity than some of the other departments within a building. And so making sure that you actually have the buy-in and the partnership of other departments internally is so important for making sure that there's morale and good, like, a spirit de corpse of the, of the, of the team. Because you're probably going to have to talk to lawyers a lot more because there's, the lawyers have already figured out how TV ads work. Lawyers have figured out how direct mail works. But, you know, you're always figuring out how digital works. So it's always changing. And, and the lawyers definitely often don't like that. Um, and the communications team, there's always different ways where there can either be a really great partnership or if it doesn't work out right, a lot of friction. And I think people at all levels of the digital team feel that. And the more you have good partnership and good buy-in by the building overall, the more you're going to be able to maintain and build a really good team. Uh, but it, it is hard to, to find folks. Um, and, but once you do find people, I think some of the most effective political organizations are the ones that are able to build on that team cycle over cycle because even though there's always new things coming in, a lot of the knowledge about how to operate digital within a certain organization, within a political organization, that's really hard to replicate. It's almost impossible to start from scratch. So being able to build and maintain and grow these teams cycle over cycle, the organizations that do that have really great digital operations. The ones that try to start from scratch every year or two, they're gonna never move forward. My team knows their institutional knowledge is invaluable. Yeah. And that on some level, while they're replaceable, they're probably not replaceable. And we, we all need to like, as a firm, we need to reciprocate financially just to keep them around. Definitely. No, I definitely agree with that as, as someone who runs an agency as well. It's just, it's, it's and I agree, it's, it's hard to start people from scratch, you know, bringing the cost of bringing in someone new onto a digital team is, is high. Um, so it's, it's definitely the people who stay with you because these platforms evolve daily, weekly, um, and to, to have someone start from new all the time is, is difficult. Um, I know we want to have time for questions. You want me to go one more time around with the panel or you want to move to Let, questions? Let's see if we have some questions from the audience okay. first. Questions for our audience. Were there any unusual, since um, Phil, you mentioned that, that a lot of new, in the last couple of cycles, we've seen a lot of new, um, new pieces of data come and fill out that, uh, that voter pro profile. I'm curious if this cycle we saw data points that really popped out as unusual, um, native to this particular cycle, that were really driving um, voting in, in a different way from what you expected? Were we seeing the profile evolve so we had a deeper and different understanding of what was moving voters this cycle? Answer is yes, and I'm not gonna speak to them because some of them are really scary, but yes. Oh, come on. No, I mean, there, there, there are definitely things that are popping out all the time. You're like, wow, that's the greatest indicator of whether somebody's voting in a Republican primary? What's going on here? But you know, you have those moments where you're like, uh, where a data point pops out at you and it kind of navigates you to your messaging. I mean, this is maybe a little less mysterious, but, um, you know, and this is something that is, everyone's already heard before, but a lot of people who came out and voted in the presidential in, in 2016 for President Trump aren't necessarily people that were on voter files. That's, they were, exactly they were right. people with a voting history. And so I think for a lot of the midterm elections, the cycle, or maybe all the midterm elections this cycle, whatever side of the aisle you're on, you're trying to figure out how does the 2016 election and the turnout for the 2016 election affect the 2018 or 2017 uh, midterms. And if you are not the president, how do those people play on a Republican ticket? If you're not the president, how do those voters who haven't voted before, who haven't voted for a governor before or a senator before, or haven't voted in midterm before, how do they um, factor in because they played such a key part in the 2016 election? And um, I, I don't think anyone like fully answered that question, but trying to make sure that the models, as we were talking about early, earlier, factor those voters in and trying to figure out what messaging potentially resonates with those voters was something that was really top of mind for a lot of campaigns. You know, go ahead. Um, I, well, I want to add, like, to a certain extent, like, context and timing it also plays a role in this in the sense that um, data changes, values change, um, the way that people make decisions change, right, uh, based off of the environment and, and what's going on, too. 
Um, and so that very much plays a role um, in, again, like how we wait and how we uh, make our assumptions in terms of what we're using and how we're using it to talk to people. One thing I can share that I thought was really interesting is this year, um, you know, all of these uh, cord cutter models get refreshed on, you know, every three months, it seems like. Um, there are, you know, in Florida, statewide, I found that there were over a million people on our cord cutter model. And that's a staggering amount. I mean, it makes sense. I'm 36. I haven't had cable uh, for 10 years. But that's a, a million people is a lot of folks to be talking to who are never going to see a broadcast TV ad. They're never going to see um, a, you know, a, a cable ad. And uh, we've got to find a way to talk to them. And this year, I just felt like, wow, this is a segment in, that's big enough to spend six figures on a regular basis with. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, um, I'm Melissa from Univision. And speaking about segmenting um, audiences, I wanted to know what your digital strategy is and how it changes when it comes to reaching people of color and specifically people who don't, uh, whose first language might not necessarily be English. Um, I'm happy to, to take, take a stab at this one. Um, so this was a really great question, really valuable question. I think it's something that we talked a lot about uh, this year and, and how to address that and how to go about it. Um, and, you know, um, the way that we, you know, again, with the testing um, and sort of the spreading out of resources in terms of the data was really important to us. It was really important to us to do targeting in Spanish uh, to, to speak to people, for example, whose browser settings um, are, are set to Spanish uh, to use in-platform data was critically important. I mean, this is one area where, um, you know, um, so w where we know that the voter file is on occasion lacking um, when we talk about youth, when we talk about uh, sort of uh, communities of color um, and, uh, you know, sort of mobile voters. And so, again, it's very important when we think about our approach to data and our approach to targeting to think about the universe that we want to talk to and then move from there. It's not always built from the voter file. It's who are we talking to and what is the best way to talk to them, the best data set to be able to, to find that person. You know, one of the things I've really been... Um thinking about and implementing is making sure that when we do Spanish language advertising that um, we take into consideration the uh, background nationality of those individuals and um, segment out not just Spanish language but um, if we're doing stuff in Florida that um, you know all, all of the different nationalities represented are getting um, marketing that's speaking to them uh, in their in their own dialect and their own uh, in their own way, and that's not even saying we're changing the message around, but that's just saying you know different groups receive messages in different ways, and we want to be cognizant of that as we target. I think something that's exciting from the digital standpoint is that you know African American and Hispanic uh, voters they over-index for use on digital use of digital platforms, use of social media, mobile. And and mobile. So I think it's something that as kind of the digital voice in the room during uh, budgeting decisions and trying to determine where we allocate our resources, something that we just try to stay aware of and, and you know, evangelize to the organization in general that t working with the digital team and having really a digital first strategy is often with perhaps the more effective ways to reach these kind of audiences. Sue, 